Well, it is my distinct pleasure this morning to introduce our guest pastor, preacher, speaker this morning. And, and I asked him beforehand, what would you like me to say? And he goes, I don't know, just come up with something. So he was like the fifth man to step on the moon. How do you like that? It is a true story, yeah. Well, actually, I don't really need to make stuff up about him because he has decades of ministry experience and lots of different positions within the church as a family life director, um, helping run a camp, youth camp for almost a decade, to being one of the co-founders of the Hope Water Project, where they brought hope through Jesus and, and water to the impoverished and marginalized and neglected people of Western Kenya to picking up his family and driving across the country from Michigan to California because his family had a heart for those who didn't know Jesus. And they found that you go to the Bay Area of San Ramon and people don't know Jesus. So it is my pleasure to welcome, and would you please join me in welcoming Pastor Clint Dupin. Thank you, sir. I'll tell you what, when you guys are able to find like a good worship band, this place will take off. I really believe that. I really, they're amazing. Like that, you guys, they are absolutely incredible. Now, I know I haven't been to a live like service in about nine months, but I'm pretty sure I remember, I don't remember anything like that. That was absolutely incredible. Hey, my name is Clint Dupin, and um, I'm up here trying to get into my iPad right now, so uh, give, me a, give me a second. Anyways, my family is here with me. They're on the front, in the front chairs right here. I have my wife, Michael, and then there's Henry and Charlie and Claire, and then our oldest daughter, Savannah, is not with us this morning. Uh, she's still alive. She's just not present with us uh, today. I always say that wrong. I just want to take a few moments out and just say what a pleasure it is to be here uh, at Shoreline. I've heard so many great things about Shoreline. Yes, and through Kevin and Sherry. I'm so thankful for those guys. Are they not the best? They're absolutely incredible. We love those guys. I got to know Kevin and Sherry. Uh, Michael and I actually got to know Kevin and Sherry many years ago uh, when they were in Michigan, and uh, they have been such a pleasure. There's people everywhere. So it's been, are there, okay, so anyways, there's every, like, I, I'm going to forget to look at some of you guys, but um, it's, it's, those guys are incredible, and we're so thankful for them, and we're so thankful for this church, and by the way, this is just, this is not normal. I, I, I don't know if you guys are getting used to uh, where you live right now. This is not normal. I'm from Michigan, right? That's where, like, hell was invented um, in Michigan, in the sub zeros, right? But this is absolutely incredible. Um, but I'm going to continue on your series today. And you've been in a series in Romans called I Will. And two weeks ago, Kevin talked about I Will Serve and shared all the great things that you guys are doing as a community, as a church community for your, your neighbors. And then you're also doing, um, oh, thank you. I have a bag. I have a gym bag with me today. Anyways, um, you guys are doing some incredible things like that. I Will Serve. You guys talked about that. And then last week, you talked about I Will Love, right? You talked about I Will Love. And he gave me the topic of judgment. So that's a fun one, uh, to come in as a guest speaker and speak on judgment. Um, how many of you would love to be up here and talk about I will not judge? But that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, because I, I would say this, is that um, I want to go back to the last song. Um, it really hit me during the first service, uh, those first lyrics about the, the mountaintop and then the valley. And it talked about how God is with us on the mountaintop, but he also sees us in the valley. And I don't know about you, but there, I would rather be on the mountaintop than I would want to be in the valley. And this last eight, seven, eight, nine months now, I, I would say that a lot of us have experienced more valleys than we have mountaintops. And if you haven't, you're directly connected to someone that has. And if you've been watching what's happening in our nation, there's been a lot of valley moments. But here's the truth about valleys, is growth happens in the valleys. The water runs in the valleys. The trees grow in the valley. I know we want to be up there, but before we go up there, we have to be down here for a little bit, and maybe even for a long bit. 
And a lot of us want to go back to normal. We want to be back to the place where we used to be. That might not ever be a reality anymore. And my big thing, this is a bonus message, by the way. If you guys want to take notes, the next one's coming because you're second service, so I can go forever, all right? So this is a little bonus for you. But I think this is so true, is that a lot of us, if we're not careful, we're always thinking about what is next. We're always thinking about when things go back to normal or when things get to this place or this place. And we miss out on what God is doing on the valley floor in our own lives personally in the lives of others. There's never been a greater opportunity than to share the love of Jesus Christ than there is right now. There is an openness right now because people are looking for something different because the things that they attached their lives to before this are no longer present. And so what are we doing right now to really seek and understand what God is doing right now in this season? And for those of you who are here because your parents made you come, or for those of you who are watching online and you don't necessarily have a faith and you're you're just kind of checking this thing out or you're kind of just in cruise control, it's not an accident that you're here this morning because I believe that there's gonna be some things that you hear today, right, that God wants to speak to you and that maybe for some of you today is like what I'm going to be talking about, the topic I'm going to be talking about, is exactly the reason that you don't want to follow Jesus. And so maybe that's you today. Let me, let me start in prayer. God, we just come to you right now. And I know that more than likely there's people that are sitting in the chairs here presently, people in their cars, people watching online, maybe this morning, maybe throughout this week that are looking for something different and looking for something new. Lord, we know that um, mental health issues and crises are, are skyrocketing. We know that suicide is on the rise. We know that people are hurting and in pain. God, we ask, we ask that you are present this morning. We ask that you're present in this moment. In your name, amen. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about judgment because I, I really do feel like this, topic is very fitting in this season. It's very fitting. And I would say that there's not a person in this place or watching today that isn't exempt from having judged. Some of you have already judged me. You're like, his jeans are way too tight. It's not that they're too tight. I've just grown into them over the last month. But anyways, right? It's like we judge. Don't, if you've judged me, I've judged you back, okay? But right, it's like we judge. And what does judgment do, right? Think about, think about judgment and what it does. It's like we see this, right? It's a spirit. Judgment not only fosters a spirit of criticism, but my conclusion is usually wrong. And, and many of you have, you, you've experienced that as where you've made this prejudgment about someone only to find out it's not true at all. It's not true at all. And I I was sitting right here in this chair and I was watching. This is kind of an intimidating thing, right? As you come in here, especially some of you, I've marked you down when you were late, right? Some of you are walking in there and and, and you just feel that because you've grown up in a life where you have felt judged. Whether it was on a sports team, it was in your family, it was at a school, it's in your career. It's like, it's a bombardment of judgment and you feel it. And even when you come to church, you feel it. You don't know how people are looking at you and how they're, how they're, what they're basing their thoughts on, right? And so we've seen this in this season. With the pandemic and with the election and racial unrest, we feel that judgment. And I believe that Shoreline can be a place where we bridge that gap, where we're a place of peace and a place of love. And not assuming the worst, but believing the best. But if we continue, right, as if we do, not but if, if we continue to see others as Jesus sees them, we will be that bridge. And I want you to remember that because I'm gonna bring that all the way back here in about an hour and a half to the end. Some of you are really scared. That's why you sat in the back so you can sneak out. I will judge you if you walk out, right? So I want you to listen to this. I want, there's gonna be something today I really believe. I have my sunglasses on. I didn't realize that. You guys wanna see my eyes. One person. Thanks, mom. (laughs) So I'm gonna look at, we're gonna continue looking at this book in Romans. And some of you guys have been in Romans and Paul is the author of Romans. And Paul is most likely in Rome at the time that he's writing this. 
most likely getting ready to be killed and be executed. And he's written the majority of the New Testament. So you have the Old Testament and you have the New Testament. He's, he's writing this book. And a lot of times he writes books for one of two reasons, right? To encourage or to slap you around just a little bit. Like, hey, I've been hearing this. It's going on in your, in your church. It's going on in your community. Let's stop it, all right? Let me give you some advice. Let me remind you of who Jesus was, of who he is and how he wants us to live his life. So now I know that there's somebody that's running scripture. I've cut some of these scripture out. Uh, so it's really, it might confuse, you wouldn't know because I did it in the first. I'm doing it for you because I like this service better. All right, Romans chapter 14. You then, why do you judge your brothers or sisters? Or why do you treat them with contempt? Contempt means that I look down on you, that I'm better than you. I know more than you. I have the right answer. I'm on this side, you're on this side, which makes me better. I'm on this side, you're on that side, makes me better. I know more. That's contempt. This is what Paul is talking about. For we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow before me. This, this, is, this is great, right? This is every knee. It's like I have children, and I know when I correct them or, or their mother corrects them, It's like sometimes there's an acknowledgement of their wrong, and then there's sometimes where they're just saying, yeah, I was wrong, but they're not going to bend willingly, right? Is what is Paul reminded of? There will be a day of reckoning. There will be a day where we will either willingly or unwillingly bend our knee. He's saying this. So then each of us will be given an account of ourselves to God. Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother and sister. I would challenge you to go ahead and read the rest of that little passage. He goes, there must have been an issue with food and drink and wine. There was, there's some stumbling and judgment that is happening. I'm going to skip down to verse 19. Let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to, and to mutual edification. If we were to just hear one thing, I love that last song. It's talking about peace. It's talking about love. It's like if we were people of peace, it would solve almost all of our issues, right, that we're dealing with. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean. And he's talking back, he's he's referring back to what he just talked about. But it is wrong for a person to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. Now, before I go into some points, I want you to think of some things. It is important to know what Paul is challenging us with. It's not behavior modification, but it's inward transformation. Like Paul is speaking to something deeper, right? He's not speaking to what's happening on the outside. He's speaking on what's happening on the inside. Now, it's coming out through these other issues. It's coming out with behavioral things, but Paul is speaking on a different level. And we can almost make the conclusion that what we put our trust in will either lead us to a spirit of judgment or a spirit of peace. What are you watching? What are you taking in? What are you meditating on? What your soul, what what is happening in your soul? Because here's the thing, the more we allow God's truths in, the more we meditate on his word, the more we rest in his promises and and act those out, the more peace and love that we're able to give to others. This is his plan. This is what was the plan from from day one. Now, I ran, I had an opportunity. I don't know if it's an opportunity, but I ran a half marathon. I know what some of you, I know, I know it. I can see your faces. You're going, why why wouldn't you run a whole one? You know what? Why don't you go run a whole one? All right. It's awful. It's awful. I did run a whole one, so there. If you want to hear about the story later, we can talk about it. It was, I won't ever do it again. I, I, in fact, you heard I, I started an organization called Hope Water Project. I ran for clean water. I'm, I'm just going to be honest and truthful with you right now. Um, we raised like over a million dollars in that race or, or because so many people ran the marathon. There was a point in the marathon where I had this. We were, we're running for the Pokot people in western Kenya. There was a point where I said, you know what? You can go find your own clean water. There was. I just got to that place. Uh, marathons make you do things awful. 
Okay, so anyways, I was, I just, I've been carrying that. I wanted to deliver that to you. But I was running. The next year, I got smarter. I said, I'm going to run a half marathon. I'm going to run it with one of my closest friends, Andrew. And Andrew, man, he, he's just fit. Like, he's got the right shoes, the right shorts. Like, he's, you know, his, his body is made normally. My body, I'm, I have really short legs, a long torso. But anyways, we're getting ready to start this race. And he goes, man, you know, my stomach's kind of funny. I was like, oh, don't worry. So we get to mile five. Andrew's like, Clint, I got to stop. I'm like, okay. And he goes, yeah, I just don't, my stomach's not fine. I'm like, all right, man, I'm, I'm with you. I'm with you, thick and thin, thick and thin, brothers, right? And he's like, yeah. So we get to mile seven, and we had already stopped two or three more times. Now I'm starting to like, okay, we're, not, we're cousins, not brothers, but you know, we're, not, we're not quite there anymore. And so then we get to mile nine or 10, and he's like, Clint, I, I really got to stop. You go on. You go on. And I kind of, you know, that, at that moment, I wanted to be like loyal. I was like, hey, no man left behind, right? And he's like, no, just leave me. I was like, okay. Um, but anyway, I, said, I said, Andrew, what did, you, what did you eat last night? And he's like, well, I had, I had like uh, half a rack of ribs, uh, two pieces of pizza, and then he had like two beers. And I said, peace. I said, I'm out. I'm out. I left him. I left him to just kind of, I just kind of rolled him over in the ditch. And I just, I was like, I'm, I'm going to finish this thing. But then we've joked around and talked about it even more. I'm like, Andrew, why would you do that self to you? Why would you do that to yourself before half marathon? You know, but this is what we do as followers, right? Is we find ourselves in situations where we judge and we're harsh and we're, you know, we have no patience and no tolerance for certain things. Why? Because of what we dwell on. This is what Paul is talking about. He's like, a lot of times we like to put the focus there and not the focus here. So I want to say this. Let's start here on your paper on the back there. The first thing we have to do is look in the mirror. I'm not going to blow you away by any of my points. I, I, I'm not. I was up in Kevin's office today. I think he has the original Bible up there. Like this guy has books. I, I'm not going to do it. So just you don't need to hold on to anything. Like it's not going to blow you away. But I'm going to give you something simple today that I believe that you can use and that can change your life. First thing we have to do is look in the mirror. It starts with you. It starts with us. Paul is asking, why do you judge? He's not asking why someone else next to you is doing what they are doing. He goes, you give an account for your actions, not someone else's. Every morning, we are confronted with the mirror. We see ourselves, and what do we do? We spin there, and we, we, we spend time there, and we try to make ourselves better, try to make ourselves, you know, cover up the flaws, Paul's like, listen, you've got a deal. Mirrors don't lie, but our minds can distort what we see reflected back. When the mirror we look in is something other than what God thinks about us, it is something other than God, such as our personal standards or our cultural standards, our view of ourselves become distorted. Now, here's two things that we do when they become distorted. We either become overcritical of ourselves some of us have seen this. It's like we're overcritical of ourselves, which then makes us overcritical of others. We hold everyone to an impossible standard. Or maybe you do this. We think too highly of ourselves, and in that we become judgmental of others because they are not as good as me. I mean, haven't we seen this in this season? Is where we just almost despise people that believe differently than us, that behave or act differently than us. Paul says, for we will all stand before God's judgment seat. It is written, as surely as I live, says the Lord, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess and acknowledge God. So then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. Now, I remember being this age, hearing that verse for one of the first times, and just really thinking like, but that's going to be a scary day. That's going to be a, a day full of shame. There's going to be a whole, it's going to be like a courtyard. And people are just like, I knew Clint was rotten, right? And I was just scared to death of this scripture. It's always scared me. And maybe it's caused shame in your life that you are going to be put to shame on that day because you could never measure up. But when we view the mirror as God, we view ourselves through his eyes and the way he sees us. We don't have to wait 
for this great, scary day of judgment. Our shortcomings, our sins, our mistakes can be exposed now. We can see the way we are living compared to how he has designed us to live. And this is the truth I want you to hang on. If you're gonna write something down, write this down. When our sin is exposed, his grace is revealed. The enemy will have you thinking differently. But when our sin is exposed, his grace is revealed. When this happens, transformation in our lives happen. And only then are we able to reciprocate that grace to others. Because when you are allowing God to transform you from the inside out, you can do nothing else but share that with others. The peace that you are experiencing, you are now the vehicle of peace for someone else. This is the church. The church isn't about four walls. The church is about you. You are the person, you are the bringer of peace and love and grace. We are to deliver that. It's hard to view others as children of God when there is a spirit of judgment. If there is any one of us that deserves that judgment, it's me. In the end, it's God's gentleness, not his wrath, that draws us back in. When we realize who God is in our lives and what he has done for us, our kindness has the power to draw others in instead of push them away with our judgment. I'm talking about the God of the Bible. When we look at these type of things, here's the things, what, here's the thing, here's what's really, really important. I would say a lot of Christ followers, myself included, we have created our own version of God or we've created our own version of Jesus and he condones what we condone. He votes the way that we vote. He makes the choices, the, the, the choices that we would make. And we say, well, that's not the Jesus that I serve. This is the Jesus that I serve. It's like, it's not about your Jesus. It's the Jesus of the scripture. And this is what Carrie Newhoff says. If God has all the same opinions you do, you're probably not worshiping God. Think about this. It's like a lot of us have condoned our lifestyles. A lot of us have condoned the judgments and the harsh things that we have said and says, well, God believes the same thing. Jesus would say the same thing. The only time Jesus got angry was in church. He loved those that were far from his father. He was a dispenser of grace and peace. Grace always arrived first with Jesus. Felt like that was pretty good. Okay, let's keep going. (laughs) Here's the prayers that I think are really important if this is gonna be our lens. God, search me. God, break me. God, stretch me. Next, we have to do is look in the church. Paul says, therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Usually we tend to judge others who don't live up to our standards, even if we are not living up to them. Isn't it crazy? Is the things that we put other, how we judge others, it's not even how we're living our life, especially behind closed doors. I wanna take some freedom here and talk about those um, outside the church Um, because I know that Paul is really referring to people inside the church, but I think this is important and it's necessary because the view of people that do, the, the view that people have of people that are followers of Jesus Christ is not a good one. And in fact, there's a lot of hate and there's a lot of, uh, separation between followers and people who call themselves followers and, and people who are not followers. And, and, and the top or the reason being is the topic that we're talking about today. There's a book called Unchristian. I would um, encourage you to read it, and it describes a survey uh, that it took between people ages 16 and 29. Authors asked this age group what they thought of church and church people. One of the overwhelming conclusions was that church people are very judging of others. It's a horrible trait that pushes others away and, in fact, makes the Christian seem unchristian. The perception Christians are prideful and quick to find fault in others. They are society's judges. Do Christians do this? Do I, have I done this? Yes, I've done this. And this is the perception. We were at a church called Kensington Church right outside of Detroit. And my wife and I launched their fourth campus in 2007. And it was around probably 2014, 2015. I started feeling this nudge 
and I had been a part of a couple of church plants, one with my dad when we moved from North Carolina to Michigan, and then one in Sacramento uh, before moving back to Michigan. And I did not want to plant a church. I knew what it took to start a church, but I just kept feeling this nudge inside is that I, I, I felt like this is the way where it was going to be or, or what it was going to be. I remember going to my wife and saying, hey, I think God is asking us to plant a church. And she says, by us, do you have a friend in your pocket? Because I'm not doing it. We're always, we've always been like this. Okay, so anyways, right? It's like we've always, like, we had to wrestle through that. We had to pray through that. And so, but I've always had this heart. I've always, since, since I first found Jesus, or when I first started following Jesus, I've had a heart for people that did not like the church and did not like Christians. I just have always had that heart. And one of our things was we, we knew we wanted to come back to California. We loved where we were, but we knew that God was calling us to a place. And many of you know this, and Kevin's probably shared this with you before, but the highest unchurched, de church population is in the San Francisco Bay Area. And so we felt the call. Let's go there. So we picked up and we moved. We left family and friends because this call was so strong and it was so real to us. And when we landed in uh, the East Bay, is I remember, I, I mean, at first, I didn't even know what we were going to do or where we even would start, but we just started meeting people, and we would talk to people, and we'd get to know people. And one of the things that we knew was this. We found a lot of, we saw a lot of churches that were like Shoreline. They were amazing. And we, 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 knew, to our, we, we knew, like, in our conversations, like, it's not about planting more churches to reach more people, right? It's about what, something needed to change, we needed to change people's perception because of people that we met over and over and over were saying, hey, the reason I don't go to church is one, it's irrelevant. I don't get why I would go. Would I take the best day of my, my week and go and spend it at church? Uh, the second reason that we heard is because, no, we would feel judged. Or, you know, I know a Christian. That's why I wouldn't go to church because of how I've been treated by them. So our goal became, we really felt like God was directing us. How do we create something to change people's perception of not just the church, but of Christ's followers. So we knew, do we have a Sunday morning experience? Absolutely. We love it. Great. It's not there anymore because of COVID, right? But we knew like it had to be something different. It had to start where you live. It had to be in your homes. It had to be your neighborhoods. It had to be workplaces and social spaces. If we're going to see that 97% start to decrease Something had to be different. It couldn't just be starting another great church. It had to be, be, be by followers of Jesus saying, this is real, and it's so real in me, I have to share it with others. It has to change the way my home is. It has to change my neighborhood. It has to change my workplace. This is what has to happen, and this is what we knew we needed to figure out. Paul knows how we deal with one another will affect those who are not yet in a relationship with Jesus. In Corinthians, another letter that he writes to the Corinth church, he says, for what I have I to do with judging others, it is not those inside the church who you are to judge. God will judge those on the outside. It's not those inside the church whom you are to judge. God will judge those on the outside. So what does judging look like? If we do look inside the church, looking in the church, what does it look like? It's those people you're in relationship with. If you see drifting happening, it's your responsibility to just step in in relationship and say, hey, I just want to have a conversation. Maybe the second thing is this. Pray before entering the conversation. Is this a window or is this a door that God wants you to step through? Make sure grace arrives first. Truth can come later. And you are speaking, remember this, you are speaking their future into existence. This is something that Jesus would always do. Anytime he arrived on a scene, people were welcome as they were, but they always left changed. They didn't stay as they were. He knew this, right? It's like he would always speak to them. This isn't how you were created. This isn't what I intended for you. And the last one is this, look with new lenses. Look with new lenses. In verse 19, it says, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. The part I want to dwell on here is what leads to peace and mutual edification. We see the outside. God sees the heart. He sees 
at the core. Don't judge without knowing the story. I think this is so important is that for some of us, we are the way we are because of our culture, because of how we grew up, because of the people that we've chosen to surround us. And maybe for some of us, it's time to take the old lenses off and put on the new lenses. And those lenses are the lenses that God can only give you and that he will start helping you see people as he sees them. He will help you start loving people as he loves them. I know that one of the, one of the, if you're angry with people or you're upset with people, you're, you're put off by people, I want you to imagine, can you believe this, that they, those are sons and daughters of Jesus. When you're looking at that person, instead of despising them, imagine Jesus right there next to them with his arm around them saying, hey, as you speak to them, as you think about them, as you judge them, remember I'm right here. This is my son. This is my daughter. By the way, that's helped a lot in our marriage. When I start viewing my spouse as a daughter of God and how I speak to her and how I talk to her. Don't worry, I'm not going into a marriage series. It's okay, right? But what does that look like? In this past season, it's been tough on all of us. With the racial unrest, like I said earlier, with the election season, COVID, the pandemic, there's been a lot of judgment, a lot of judgment without understanding the whole story. One of my closest friends is a, is a person of color, and, and I was spending some time in prayer, and I asked God, I said, God, I want you to reveal in my own life, where have I judged and to who? And this person just kept coming back in my prayer, and I felt like God was asking me to ask this question to him. Has there been anything that I've done to hurt you or our relationship that's been hurtful in this relationship? I remember calling him and said, hey, I would love to. God kept nudging me. I put it off for a few weeks. God kept nudging me. You need to go have this conversation. And by the way, I, I spoke this out to my wife. So she also helped the Holy Spirit with the nudging. And I remember calling him and saying, hey, can I come over and have this conversation, which would have been weird to him because I never call him. I just walk over to his house. He happens to be one of my neighbors. And I remember sitting on his front patio and we began to have this conversation. I was a little nervous. And I usually pray during these conversations as I'm having it, as I'm one ear to heaven, one ear to the ground. I was like, God, you have me here. What is it that you want me to speak? And I remember my window of opportunity. I said, hey, I said, this is on my heart. Have I caused any hurt or pain in this relationship? And there was this silence. And then he began to share with me in the most humble tone. And he said, do you remember when you did this? Do you remember when you said this? Do you remember how you say these type of things without even understanding what that means to a totally different culture? And there was part of me in my sinful nature where I wanted to, def right at the beginning, I wanted to kind of defend myself. But where does that get us? Because I think for a lot of us, what we want to do is we want to be we want to be right more than we want to have that relationship. We want to be right. We want to say the right thing more than we want to share the love of Jesus. And I remember sitting there and I remember tearing up. And I said, man, I am so sorry. And we begin to have more of those conversations. But I, I, I can't imagine if a percentage of this group that's watching online, a percentage that's sitting here or there, wherever it is in the first service, if we begin to take that if we begin to understand the role that we play and the power that we have for healing, when we simply take off those old lenses and we allow God to put on those new lenses. As humans, we see behavior. God sees the heart. I can still remember, um, I have really bad eyes. So I can see, I, I have my contacts in, they're really big contacts. And um, my eyes have been bad my whole life. Um, my mom tells me the story, and every time she tells me the story, she starts crying. Um, and I remember when she first told me this story, she said, because I have, I have really thick glasses, and you know, I, I learned to wear contacts because I felt judged in the eighth, ninth grade. I would be made fun of all the time for the glasses I wore. And so I finally figured out my mom would get up an hour early before school. I didn't tell the first service this because I'm already over four minutes. So you guys get this little bonus again. 
Um, but I remember being judged. And I remember my mom would get up early, 45 minutes to an hour earlier than she normally would do to help me get my contacts in. And she would tell me this story. And I remember she would, she would start having, she'd start crying and she goes, I took you to the doctor when you were a year and a half or two years old, I can't remember. She goes, we knew something was wrong with you. We just didn't know what. I'm like, thanks, mom. And um, she goes, the doctor came out and said, hey, your son can't see. He's, he's literally blind. He cannot see. And I'm like, mom, it took you two years to figure that out? How many cliffs did I fall down, right? And she said, Clint, I remember we went to the optometrist. We got you glasses and we put those little glasses on you. And this is when she starts crying. She says, you sat and you stared at me for over an hour. You stared at me for over an hour. She goes, then I took you home and, and your dad comes walking in and you looked at him for over an hour. You just sat and looked at him. And then your brother walked in. You said you looked at him for a minute. But then she would take me outside and I would just begin to look at the trees. She said, for, this would happen for a couple of days, Clint. You would look at the trees. You would look at the sky. You begin to notice nature for the very first time. This was like the first time your two-year-old self had ever seen. I think about the reason that Jesus came to teach us how to be human. To teach us that we were not only to have a relationship with the Heavenly Father, but to see others as he sees them. And I imagine there's many moments, more than what we see in the scripture where it's my favorite verse, Jesus wept because it's short. I bet he wept all the time because he sees so much pain and hurt. When we start seeing God for who he is and who we are in his view and through his lenses, and we start allowing that peace and that transformation to take over, can you imagine the way we see others? And can you imagine what starts to happen in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our cities, in our nation, and in our world? I don't know what step that you need to take, but for some of you, you've never seen through those lenses. Yes, you've been coming to church for years, but you're still as judgmental as anyone else. I don't judge you for that because I know that there's pain deep within you that you have not dealt with. And for some of you that are watching or listening today, that's the way that you want to live your life. And you can do that today. Pray with me, Lord, we just come to you in this season and this time. And we know it's tough. And we know the weight that we have felt over the last few months. God, I pray right now for healing to take place. God, I pray right now that we could see others the way that you see them. Lord, give us a glimpse of what that would look like right now so that we could experience that transformation in our own lives. Lord, thank you for Shoreline. Thank you for Kevin and Keith and the leadership. Thank you for Sherry. Thank you for everyone here, this staff, this team. Lord Jesus of volunteers, amazing. In your name, amen. God bless you. Hey, can we thank, can we thank Pastor Clint? I was more convicted the second service than the first service. I thought I got that all out of the way, the first service. Thank you very much. I got a couple quick announcements for you. If you need prayer, maybe you're struggling with something right now, whether it's something in your life, maybe it's something about the message. Uh, Pastor Dennis and Pastor Roy are back there on the, the back dock, and they would love to pray for you. If you're online, uh, we'd love to have you uh, email prayer at shoreline.church, or you can text into 831 Two two one zero two nine zero, and we would love to pray with you. If you're new to Shoreline, we'd love to have you text the word "welcome" to um, that same phone number eight three one two two one zero two nine zero. If you're here on campus, Patty, our connections director, is in the back, right by our connections booth, and she would love to meet you and to get you connected into the life of this church. And then finally. Uh, we haven't been doing this as much recently, um, but I was just really feeling like I needed to share. Um, thank you for your financial giving to the Ministry of Shoreline. Um, it's been a, an, an uncertain season, you know, for the last eight or nine months, and we didn't really know what was going to happen. Uh, and we didn't know financially what was going to happen with this church. We, we, we didn't know how we were going to be able to keep getting ministry going. 
And the fact of the matter is that this church body has been incredibly generous. It has been an amazing thing to see week in and week out this church give generously to the ministry that we're doing. And we are feeding hundreds of people a week. We are continuing ministry. We've got kids' ministry going on in the bottom of the parking lot. We're doing online groups. We're able to to gather here. We're able to to put our services online. We're able to do our monthly nights of worships. We're able to have our, our grief share going and our Bible studies and so much. And it's because of the generosity of this church. And so I just felt like I needed to take a moment and say thank you. Thank you for giving, and please don't stop. We want to continue to grow. We want to continue to, to touch more and more lives. We want to be used by God, and it does take your generosity to make that happen. And now, I pray that God would lead you as you go into this world, that you would be able to, to look in the mirror, that you would be able to look in the church, that you would be able to see the people in your life, the way God sees them. And that through you and your life, your family, your home, your neighborhood, your workplace, this country, and this world would be transformed. God bless you. Go in peace. Be used by God. Have a great day.